For hours, India and Canada have indulged in a second round of tit-for-tat expulsion of diplomats. All of this over absurd allegations of involvement of Indian government officials in the killing of Khalistani terrorist Hardeep Singh Nijjar last year. Hours after India withdrew its diplomats from Canada, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police added a new twist to the entire saga. They drew a link between agents of the Indian government and the Lawrence Bishnoi gang. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau then accused the Indian government officials of engaging in what he called were clandestine information gathering techniques, coercive behaviour targeting Canadians and involvement in threatening and violent acts. But where's the proof of any of that? Is this just another shoot and scoot tactic by a politician who is under the hammer electorally? Now I say that because Trudeau's allegations coincide with sliding support and tanking popularity ratings for him. Last week, he survived a second parliamentary confidence vote in as many weeks ahead of an election next year. Now, India, in the clearest of terms, has asserted that no specifics have so far been provided by Canada on these allegations. Today, sources within the Ministry of External Affairs said that this was the same old Trudeau saying the same old things for the same old reasons. Justin Trudeau's press conference, followed by the briefing of his police, is a bundle of contradictions to say the very least. Here's what doesn't add up. The claim that was made by the RCMP is that there is a Bishnoi link to the Indian government officials. But the fact is that it is the Canadian administration that provides safe haven to Goldie Brar and several others who are known to have links with Lawrence Bishnoi, a man who is in jail here in India. The claim being made from the Canadian side is that members of pro-Khalistani movement are the ones that India is against. Great that the Royal Mounted Police actually went on to say that there is a presence of Khalistani elements on Canadian soil. The fact of the matter is, despite dossier after dossier being given by India to Canada, no action has been taken on any of the extradition requests by India so far. The claim that was made by the Canadian side is that Indian agents are coercing and threatening businesses in Canada. If that was the case, where are the cases, where are the complaints against any Indian government officials or any Indian national for that matter, if they allegedly threaten these businesses as Canada claims. The Canada's foreign minister yesterday was asked whether the country is looking to impose sanctions on India. Melanie Jolie responded by saying that expelling diplomats was one of the toughest measures that a country could take under the Vienna Convention, but everything is on the table. Now, if that's the case, India too has many moves in its arsenal and it has on many occasions made it clear that New Delhi reserves the right to take further steps. What these further steps could be if we do decide to take them is that tariffs could be imposed or trade could be limited as far as agriculture and energy sector goes because that's where India and Canada are deeply linked. Negotiations on comprehensive economic partnership agreements could also be halted. There could be a limiting or suspending of visas for Canadian nationals. It could affect workers and tourists as well. Tighten oversight over Canadian businesses here in India, their assets in India, all of that could come into effect as well. Collaboration with Canada on international platforms like the UN or like the G20, that could also take a hit. India's diplomatic presence in Canada could be reduced even further. If Canada says that sanctions could be imposed on India, those sanctions could be imposed by India on certain Canadian officials as well. Now, if our bilateral ties are really at a point of no return, then Canada has more to lose than India. Currently, the trade balance is in Canada's favour, which means that the value of our imports is more than the value of our exports. So if New Delhi were to put in place stronger measures, this is how it could impact Canada in terms of it having a monetary effect. Canada's agriculture exports to India, like pulses specifically, could be hit. Canadian uh, pension funds with billions invested in Indian markets could also suffer. Canada's energy and potash exports to India could be disrupted as well. Indian student visas could reduce and that eventually would hurt Canadian universities and local economies in different districts. Fewer Indian tourists would impact Canada's tourism sector as well. Canada could also lose India's support at global forums like I mentioned, like at the United Nations or at G20. Now, Canada's influence in Asia, in Southeast Asia, could also weaken because India is a key regional player and if it risks ties with us, then that is what is at risk for Canada as well. So while this tit-for-tat happens, while the ties between the two countries plummet, the question we want to ask here on Plain Speak is that this little stunt by Justin Trudeau, will that cost Canada? Will it cost them big?
is obvious that the government of India made a fundamental error. It is absolutely unacceptable. One uh, organized crime group in particular, which is the Bishnoi group. Um, so that's what we're seeing uh, here in Canada. And we believe that that group is uh, connected to uh, agents of the government of India. Let's open this up. Tara Karta, former director of uh, NSCS, uh, joins us on this broadcast. Uh, Achal Malhotra, former diplomat. Robinder Sajdev, global affairs expert. And major general retired Sanjay Messner, defense expert, joins us as well. Let me open this up by first asking Achal Malhotra. Diplomatically speaking, when we say that uh, India reserves the right to retaliate or to take stringent actions or to take the right actions that would benefit us, what do we exactly mean? What does this reserve the right to retaliate mean? What could India do from here on? Well, uh, if you want uh, my reply to be restricted only to the diplomatic aspect of it, the practice in diplomacy is that uh, when there is a reason uh, for uh, the relation between the two countries uh, going down the drain, or uh, if there is a suspicion about the role uh, of diplomats, uh, taking undue advantage of uh, their presence in the host country or vice versa. Uh, we normally uh, ought to express our anguish or disappointment with the uh, host country. What we do is take the recourse to the expulsions of the diplomats, withdrawal of our high commissioners or ambassadors, or sending uh, uh, back the representatives of the diplomats of the other country posted in our own country. In this given case, you know, Trudeau, we all know, we have all discussed the background. Trudeau created a situation where the government of India lost a complete, you know, uh, there's no sense of confidence in, anymore in the government of uh, Trudeau as far as the safety and security of our senior diplomats is concerned. He has raised doubts about their credentials and credibility and creating an atmosphere where they could be targeted. They were being targeted in the past also. But when you come and make an allegation uh, of their direct involvement in the killing of a terrorist uh, uh, in Canada, uh, then you put their life in danger. So the best course of action for us was to uh, call them back home uh, so that their safety and security is ensured and also show our, give a message. It's also a messaging for Canada and for anybody else that we are not going to take things lying down. India is no more, uh, you know, a country which uh, doesn't react or retaliate. And whosoever uh, was pursuing here in the Canadian High Commission the interest of the Trudeau government, and we have decided to send them back, pack their bags and go back home. Uh, this is as far as the, uh, you know, the, the, the diplomatic framework is concerned. Now, whether it will have impact on other uh, aspects of our bilateral relations or not, uh, that remains to be seen uh, what happens uh, next, uh, whether we decide to uh, take it further to trade, commerce, investments, people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, that, I think, uh, remains to be seen. If you ask my personal opinion, hmm. uh, I think going by the India-China um, uh, example, uh, what has happened is from government, we have already stopped uh, sort of, you know, talking to them. And we have made it known to them that uh, unless there is a tranquility on the borders, we are not going to talk anything uh, else. But trade is going on. Many other things are going on. In fact, trade is multiplying. Uh, investments are maybe not in the government sector. So similarly, whether we will take those drastic uh, steps would depend on the further course of action, maybe we'll wait and see. Trudeau's uh, government is, uh, is it's a number, days are numbered. It's a matter of few more months. Uh, Trudeau is definitely going to go. How conservatives are going to behave, 
that again remains to be seen. But the larger issue of you know the Canadians patronizing and giving shelter to blatantly anti-India terror and extremist uh, elements is something which has to be addressed very seriously. And let me tell you, this is in the genes, in the DNA of Canadians, perhaps. I take you back to the 1982, when Mrs. Gandhi had asked for the tradition of, uh, you know, the, uh, the terrorist Parmar uh, from Canada. And it was this Trudeau's father, who was a prime minister at that time, who refused. And that Parmar was uh, found responsible later for the uh, mid-air killing, uh, the uh, blasting of... Uh, bombing of the Air India Kanishka. Mm. And who died out of 300 plus 250 were Canadian citizens. Something like that, you know, he's doing for the rest of Canada. He's allowing these, uh, you know, uh, uh, dangerous elements not only to settle down, multiply, but patronize them, depend on them for the vote bank for a very narrow, uh, you know, political ambition, political uh, gains, they are actually not realizing the seriousness of the problem these people, these same elements can become for them. Absolutely, In and this 90s, despite them actually admitting to it, because yesterday when we saw this press conference by the Royal Canadian Mounted, uh, Mounted Police, they went on to say that, yes, there are these pro-Khalistani elements or Khalistani elements that India is acting against. It was perhaps a slip-off from their side, but it's an admission that you have been harboring these elements for too long. This despite uh, not doing anything. Absolutely. Uh, not doing and, anything. and this despite uh, Tarakarta, the multiple dossiers that India has given to them, the multiple documented proof that India has given to Canada on at least four individuals. And their role of fomenting trouble both in Canada and of orchestrating attacks here in India. Absolutely no word on that. By their own admission, they are harboring all of them. And yet, we have the Canadian Prime Minister and his entire cabinet and the police standing there and wanting to lecture New Delhi. You know, this has been repeatedly, we've shared dossiers, we've shared information, we've shared intel. I mean, we've told them, I don't know, I've lost count. I mean, in, in all these years in government, how many times we've done this, right? And it, it's, it's like water off a duck's back. Nothing happens. So, it makes no sense to me. I mean, even uh, the only thing is that, you know, you've got gangs like this. Now, he, they say the Bishnoi gang. This is surreal at some level, right? They say the Lawrence Bishnoi gang has, you know, has done this thing. Lawrence Bishnoi is attacked a BJP person here. And he's also doing, I mean, what sense does this make? And most, I just want to bring this particular thing out. You know, the whole story is about how the, the the Indian ambassador there was involved. Now, your, your, um, uh, your, the previous speaker will endorse, in all my years in government, I have never known a diplomat ever involved in such activities. I mean, they would be horrified to be involved in such kind of things. It just doesn't happen in our system. So, the question then arises as to what is going on here? They've said, we've shared information with the five eyes. Okay, good for you. Go share the information. And then you don't share information with us for ages, for months together. You don't tell us anything. And then finally, at the last minute, you say, oh, you know, we've uncovered all this. So what were you doing all this time? All the years and years and years when we've been trying to tell you things, your intelligence agencies apparently never had the capability to find anything. But now suddenly you're active. You know, and of course, all of us know how badly the Kanishka bombing investigation was handled. And in one sense, I will hand it to Canadian authorities. They were equally damning about this investigation. I mean, there was a parliamentary look, there was a report, there was all sorts saying what a shoddy job they had done. So, sorry, we don't have, how can any of us have faith in what these people say? If you have a problem, there's a ways of taking it up. Not like this. The way Trudeau sat, went back from India, went to parliament and then made the statement in the house saying, oh, you know, India's done all this just because he was given a very bland, very bland welcome to put it mildly in India. What kind of, I mean, is this how a leader of a country behaves? 
if there is a problem there are ways like i said there are ways of handling it but at the moment this makes it is it makes no sense i'm sorry at so many levels it doesn't make any sense and you know it's interesting the timing of it all rabindra sach dev isn't it there is a commission that is looking at foreign interference that uh, justin trudeau is going to be appearing before tomorrow in fact 24 to 36 hours before that we see these kind of allegations come to the fore exactly a year after they were first made and in that one year there's very little in terms of proof that has been shared or very little in terms of investigation that has been done absolutely pura man timing in fact i mean my one thesis one analysis i'm looking at trudeau is doing what he is doing partly because of what i call as china gate if you look at the timing itself also quickly for your viewers in 2019 and 20 when the chinese interfered in canadian elections about 11 mps of trudeau's party were elected by indirect whatever supports and nine of the conservatives were defeated china thought a softer trudeau is in its favor this information was known to the canadian intelligence they did not act on it trudeau was the pm sure maybe but by early 23 and that's why again timing important this information had leaked out and globe and mail the canadian newspaper was going to break this story in the same week in which trudeau announced the niger investigation or whatever right he did it in the parliament just one day before or on the same date that this story was to break in the canadian papers that the trudeau administration has been you know has been caught sleeping has been ineffective has been pushing under the carpet the chinese influence peddling so my one thesis is that he is doing what he is doing to divert the attention from his failures on the chinese influence within the within the domestic constituency by being more aggressive towards india and if you look at timing again tomorrow as i think you are just mentioning he is to be appear before this uh, inquiry commission and in last year when he first announced this thing about niger okay in that press conference that was i think just a day before the story in globe and mail was to be released in fact there's a back story to it that the canadian or the pm office of trudeau was trying to get globe and mail to bury that story they did not agree to bury that story they said we are going to publish it and therefore one day before that he talked about this whole india uh, you, you know affair what he is doing is deflecting and diverting from his failures on the chinese front and the scandal by appearing to be more aggressive with india and saying that look here i am very strong on national security i will not let anybody you know interfere in our uh, democratic process so it's vote bank politics plus what i feel i see and if you look at the timing it is china gate and quickly one other point as mm. to the cost I think the biggest cost to Canada is the weakening of its own democracy and in that sense by the way China has succeeded I will say see the attempt of China is to weaken the institutions of democracy and social cohesion within countries that's what Russia attempted in the US they partially succeeded right that's what China wants and wanted in Canada what better than having western democracies appear weak and deeply flawed so if you look in Canada right now what's happening there is no credibility being left to their institutions as a uh, earlier speaker was saying their intelligence what were they doing this whole inquiry into china gate what were they doing mm. these gang wars what are they doing okay these courts i mean courts is not there yet but the politicians what are they doing so canadian democracy apart from the economic cost that we've been calculating right the pension funds and you know the loss of the asia pivot other than china they broken this i mean they're drifting away from china america is drifting so canada will have to drift and the asia pivot which canada was planning was to start from india actually mm. in 22 or 23 right that whole got delayed a big delegation was to come to india uh, after years of planning of canada's pivot to asia right that got sunk so those are the economic costs you know the strategic costs but a bigger cost i think from a nation's point of view is the weakening of its democracy and trudeau has been i think yes singularly responsible his leadership the way he has led his country meandering and bumbling along and raising these charges as i think all of our speakers here are saying these matters may have been have been occurring maybe earlier also could occur again uh, between mature nations they handled quietly behind the curtains they are compartmentalized and you know sure. some big deals made and not this halabala made trudeau 
escalated this matter to the level which he did because he wanted to divert attention from his failures of China. But if it's his personal loss of face or loss of credibility, and Mr. Jana, Mr. I want to get you in on that. Is it worth risking the credibility of the entire country? Like Rabindranath Sachdev was also speaking of, there are a lot of costs for the country as a whole to bear. If India were to retaliate further than what we already have and downgrade bilateral ties even more than we already have, then that could mean that Canada turns out to be the much bigger loser than India would be. Uh, Poonam, good evening. Absolutely right. I think you have uh, hit the nail on the head uh, by your question itself. Firstly, yeah, uh, the question is, does it affect the credibility of the Canada state? See, let me put it, uh, historically, uh, you know, uh, embassies have been functional, high commissions have been functional between states. There is a purpose to that. These are very sensitive uh, uh, appointments. An ambassador or a defense attache, when he's picked up, you know, his data is sent to the host country. They approve it. And thereafter, once he is deployed in that particular mission, he goes and presents his credentials. So these are very sensitive appointments and uh, they are selected by the country. And of course, wherever he is placed, there also they go into a lot of uh, detailed checks. Now, at the fag end, you start uh, blaming the ambassador and team of some officials that they are indulging in uh, so-and-so activity, you know, uh, against the interest of uh, Canada and they are involved with uh, some groups. I think that is the worst. It's such a... Uh, diplomacy is such a fine, uh, you know, uh, I, I would say that it, it involves a lot of detailed deliberation. You know, it's a reputation of both the countries. So I think it's been a very, very brazen act uh, by President uh, Trudeau, uh, by Prime Minister Trudeau. I think it is one of the most brazen acts uh, ever done. And it is going to backfire on them. I would uh, now put a, uh, you, you know, an idea. What is Pakistan doing uh, to India? Is uh, they have also been harboring terrorists and using uh, the terrorists against India. Why is Canada exactly doing uh, of harboring K terrorists against India? I think uh, he, he and his nation should be responsible and therefore it is going to backfire on him. Reason being, firstly, the Canadian public and the opposition, I think this time he'll be off from the election. His, his, uh, this, uh, this will make no headway for him. Number two, you know, trade and every way. It is going to affect him. His credibility, he does not realize that India is today the leader of the global south. The global south is today united and India happens to be the capital of global south. So he cannot be, uh, you know, taking, if uh, one word I put it, panga against India by trying to internationalize a trivial issue. It's hmm. a trivial issue. It could have been resolved much better through diplomacy. You know, he should have called the ambassador. Uh, there are, uh, there is an ambassador here, the Canadian uh, ambassador here or the high commissioner, it could have been resolved. But, you know, internationalizing and trying to publicize it and uh, trying to show India in the back. Uh, and not backing it with any proof. That's the yeah, most exactly. important bit. Making these in allegations fact, without any sort of proof, any sort of proof that's shared with the two countries or put out in public. But Achal Malhotra, as far as these allegations and the harboring of uh, Khalistani elements in Canada is concerned. Now, we're discussing what the costs of uh, this could be for both countries. But if we're talking specifically about Canada, and if we're talking about what our bilateral ties could mean, as far as harboring these terrorists is concerned, it will eventually backfire for the entire country. So why are we not seeing anyone from the other political parties, from the opposition or even from Justin Trudeau's own party say anything about this? No, I think uh, uh, as far as the uh, uh, the Sikh elements and the Punjabi vote is concerned, it's a vote bank as good uh, uh, for the liberal, uh, for the, uh, you know, Trudeau's party as it also for the conservatives. So they are not foreseeing the pitfalls of the policy of, you know, engaging or harboring or patronizing these elements, they are digging graves for themselves. They must realize that at the end of the day, so unless the political system uh, there is such that there is a clear-cut majority for one particular political party, and they don't have to really depend on any of these, uh, you know, sides uh, for their survival or for their, uh, you know, being in the government, uh, things are not going to change in any case. But let me also caution that Sikh community, you know, uh, they, 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 they have a great deal of influence already in Canada, whether it is in the business, whether it is the politics, 
uh, whether it's the numbers, you know, they're multiplying, there is a report estimating uh, their population is grow to a sizable by 2050, maybe the largest after India. Hmm. So, uh, something they have to foresee it. I think they 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 are not they are not showing that vision at all, and uh, you know as they should prevent it right now. Uh, they should not forget, uh, and I, I may go even to the extent of saying that definitely there is absolutely no chance of any Khalistan being carved out from out of the Indian territory, but there are every chances of a mini Khalistan at some point of time being carved out of Canada. And it looks Canada, like they are willing to take that risk. No, that's what I'm saying. They are not showing that wisdom. They are not showing that vision, the hmm. farsightedness. They should realize already the country is divided in a way uh, along the you know French-speaking Canadians and the English-speaking Canadians. Hmm. Uh, this demand for a separate uh, sovereign state by the Quebec, uh, you know, referendum, if you remember, 1995, hmm. uh, when they wanted... Uh, uh, to have a separate sovereign state uh, for the French-speaking uh, 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 Canadians uh, with some arrangements with the English-speaking Canadians. 1995 referendum, the contest was so close. Hmm. You know, th those who said uh, no uh, were uh, just marginally more than those who said yes. And uh, maybe these days I haven't heard about the same kind of sentiments, but that you know, under, underlying currents are there. Hmm. So, uh, why are they doing, I mean, I, I, can't they realize that they, they might end up in a situation when Canada is divided into three uh, states? And uh, So, there are a lot of risk involves, uh, risks involved yeah. and they refuse to see any of them. I'm running out of time, but Taragat, I want to, ha I want to give you the last 30 seconds. As far as how the Five Eyes are looking at this, you know, this kind of intelligence is shared between these Five Eyes nations. But the kind of response that has come to the fore, say from a United States or from a United Kingdom, who was also briefed by this, by Justin Trudeau, how do you see that going forward from here? No, in all justice, the Washington has been very discreet. In fact, they would have probably been continued to be discreet had Trudeau not pulled off this, you know, huge act which he's done. Similarly, the UK. However, my worry is that all the protests that we saw, we, in you know, some time back, there were all these protests by Khalistanis, were all in five eyes countries. So it's, I'm not saying this is equal to this, I'm not saying that, but this is, it's very troublesome, right? What is going on? And my biggest worry is not Canada itself, they can shout and scream, what effect is this going to have in, in the US? Correct. Where our team has gone there, they're talking to them. You know, that's how this is conducted. Even if something is gone, you go there, you talk to them. And that's how that's you take things forward. But, you know, there's something I'd like to say. There is a secret report by the RCM, by the CSIS or the RCMP, I think, recently, which brought out, you know, interfere, foreign interference in Canada. Hmm. They, of course, they pulled out India and said India does this. There are about six other countries whose mm -hmm. names are redacted, who are also, apart from China, they name China. They have mm -hmm. no problem with that. But there are other countries who are also interfering in Canada. Obviously, if you shelter every known criminal in the countryside, there will be people who will act against you. And mm -hmm. under international law, you are allowed, if you take this up with a country repeatedly and they do nothing, International law allows you to act in self-defense. That Which is, is why India has been making it clear that we reserve the right to act and take stringent measures for whatever is in our interest. I have to leave it at that, but I thank you all for this enriching conversation that we've had. I have to take a break on that note here on this edition of Plain Speak. But on the other side, we'll get you the big debate coming in from Maharashtra because election dates are out. They are going to take place on 20th of November. Results will be out on the 23rd, but fireworks have already begun.